Why is it that when I make a video, everyone wants to make a bloody noise? Hello and yes, welcome back to another video guys. Now then, yes, before we go any further, I will apologise about the noise. Um, my dad's trimming all the trees down and all the bushes at the minute outside in the garden. It's such a beautiful day out. I would shut the windows, but then I'm probably going to cook in here. And then I'd have to put the fan on and the fan would be distracting. So either way, there is going to be noise issues today in this video. <laughs> um, but anyway, it does not matter because you can still hear me clear enough. Um, and we've got a pretty exciting album to go over today. So Queen fans, Queen, this is the first time I'm addressing Queen fans. This is the first time I'm doing a Queen video on my channel. As you can see, I have quite a bit of Queen. I'm almost complete on them. I'm quite a semi-fan of the band. I like them a lot. They're def you know, I definitely consider them one of my favourite bands. I think they're great. They are not my favourite band, though. I can't lie. I am not. I am not the biggest fan. However, I do like them a lot. So it's pretty exciting that I'm here to go over this album today. It was requested that I review this album. Um, so, of course, trying to fulfill my um, very brilliant subscribers and commenters' wishes, I am here to review an album which has been requested, and that is Queen A Night at the Opera. Um, so, yeah, in this review, we're going to do the usual. I'm going to give you a bit of information about the album. We're going to go over each track individually, and as we go over each track individually, we're going to mark them out of 10. And then... When we're done with that, we're going to look at the uh, my copy of the vinyl record. We're going to mark the artwork at 10. And we're going to take all the scores that we're given, add them up, divided by the total number of scores given. That will give us an overall marking for this album out of 10. But we won't be done then. No, because then we've got to head over to the album ranking board, put it on the album ranking board, and see where it ranks compared to other albums that I've reviewed here on this channel. So there's a lot to do. Um, now then, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to miss some things. This is a very important album. There's a lot of detail here. So, um, before we go any further, I am going to give a shout-out to a good friend of mine here on the BC, um, Ben Simpson, who has done an incredible review of this album. Absolutely fantastic. And I know that he is one of Queen's biggest fans, if not their biggest fan. So, if you want to see someone go over this album with a lot more enthusiasm, a lot more passion for it, and a lot more detail, I really recommend you go check his review of the album out. I'm going to put a link in the description to it if you're interested in checking his take on the album. Uh, but anyway, this is going to be my take on the album, and um, yeah, we're going to get started after I have a quick drink. Got orange with me today. Something about warm weather. I can't have fizzy drinks, I've got to have a normal drink. Orange or water, definitely. But um, anyway, let's get started. So Queen, Night the Opera, this was their fourth studio album, following this one, this one, and then this one. It was released on the 21st of November 1975. It was the most expensive album at the time. Um, most expensive album made, as was the single Bohemian Rhapsody. So a lot of money went into the making of this album. And thank God it paid off for the band. It hit number one in the UK and number four in the US. And it was a very risky album, really. There's a lot of experimental on this album. A lot of strange sounds. Um, a lot of variety. And Queen have put so much money and effort into this album. They and they also had said, you know, they hadn't experienced massive success with the first three albums. Well, they done well. They didn't do quite as well as what they'd hoped the band would have done. So this album here really was, I guess you could say, a make or break album. If the album didn't um, perform as well as they wanted it to, then they would have called it quits there, and that would have been the end of Queen. Um, however, the album of course did very well, as we all know. Um, so yeah, as we all know, it was not the last thing Queen done. Um, so anyway, it was a very interesting album. A lot of, um, one of the most risky albums ever, I would say. Um, so thank God it paid off. And this album has, I believe, 12 tracks. Hang on, I haven't even counted them. Um, it's got 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yep, I was right, 12 tracks. Really, you can say 11 because the closing track is... Closing track's a closing track. <laughs> we'll get to that one. Um, but anyway, let's get started. Um, so the opening track is called Death on Two Legs. And it's a very strange way to open the album. And generally, I, I like the song, but it is not the track which I would have picked to be the opening. It's not the best track on here, that's for sure. Um, so it's dedicated to the ex-manager of Queen, who really was a very unfair manager to the band. Um, he would basically 
not give them the money that they were due. You know, um, he would take a lot of the money for himself. Did not treat the band fairly at all. I don't want to get into him too much because I don't know the whole story and I'm sure I'm going to get things wrong probably. But I know that he, he treated the band very unfairly and they did not get on. So this is a song which Freddie Mercury, of course, writ blatantly directed at him. And the lyrics are just plain, right, nasty and dirty lyrics. <clears throat> now, the way I look at it is, is it sounds like he deserved it. So go Freddie. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's a very, it's, it's, I think a lot of the band were very unsure whether they actually wanted this track to be on the album at one point, because it was very much, um, very nasty song, it's like, do we really want to say these things, we could get in a bit of trouble here, um, but anyway, the song ended up on the album, you can really hear how, uh, you know, the song really reflects in Freddie's vocals as well, very raw, very angry vocals, um, and yeah, it's 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 a very dark feeling song. Brian May, some of his most interesting guitar work here, because I think that Brian May's guitar work always sounds very, very good, but always kind of repetitive. You always get the same kind of feeling to it. However, on this song, I really think he experiments a bit on the guitar and gives us some unique sounds. So it's a pretty good song. Um, I'm going to give this track a 7 out of 10. And then we get um, Lazing on a Sunday Afternoon. Um, the next track where they wanted to go old style sound on this one, which is quite interesting. Step down the first track to a bit more, a little bit more heavy on the heavy side for Queen, I guess. Uh, much more, um, you know, full statue kind of a raw feeling. Whereas this one here is just, um, you know, very old style kind of 1930s, 1920s sounding um, track. Um, which, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's. They all had the, the, you know, they had a very different setup in the studio with this one. It was very much the, I, uh, I, I very much the, I would say, um, unique song. When I say unique, I do not mean the best, because by no means is this one of the better tracks on the album. I mean unique as in it's the most different sounding track on here, really. And it starts off with this funny little uh, piano bit to it. It's a bit of a silly song, really. Um... It's it's okay, really. It's a pretty average song, I'd say. Um, the only th I enjoy it. It's fun. But the only thing which I don't like about the song is it's going in this very old-fashioned kind of thing. And then Brian May just comes in at the end with his normal guitar sound and he's letting that rip through the end of the song. And generally, it's not a great song to start with, but generally Brian May kind of ruins it at the end. In my opinion, that's how I feel about the song. It's, it's just a funny little innocent song. And then the guitar rift at the end just kind of screws it over a bit. But I don't mind the song. I don't. So I'm going to give it a six. It's not a bad song. Um, it's pretty average, really. And then we got I'm In Love With My Car, which is the Roger Taylor song. And I really like this song. It's a, it's a song which was inspired by someone who Roger knew. I forget who he was. I think he was a Queen fan or something like that. I could be wrong. Um, but I'm sure people will let me know in the comments. Um, but anyway, you know, who actually generally was in love with his car. He, so Roger kind of took that as inspiration to write this song. And, you know, when he first brought into the studio, Brian May was um, like, yeah, sure, we're going to do that, Roger. Don't worry about it. We've got that. Uh, I think they're all kind of just joking, like, yeah, we'll give it a go. <laughs> uh, I don't think any of them were really too excited to have it on the album. But anyway, it actually turned out to be a really good song. Roger's vocals were great. And in fact, they actually got it to be the B-side to Bohemian Rhapsody. Um... Yeah, you'd probably turn Bohemian Rhapsody over and be a bit disappointed, but it's still a pretty good song, so I don't really see why the band members didn't... Because the other band members didn't want it to be the B-side. So I really don't see why they didn't want it to be there. Roger actually had to lock himself in a cupboard and protest to actually get it onto the B-side of Bohemian Rhapsody, so... Uh, um, but yeah, it's a good song. I'm going to give that track a 7. I quite like that one. And then we got You're My Best Friend, which... It's the John Deacon song, and I love this song. You know, there's a very much sentimental feelings towards this one, and of course Bohemian Rhapsody, because they're on the greatest hits, and, you know, this here I've grown up with all my life, you know, it's so, all the tracks on here are pretty much 10s out of 10s for me, because I've grown up with them, just listening to them. Um, I've got so much sentimental feelings towards this one. Is this the most clever song on here? No. Is it the most interesting song on here? No. Um, but sentimental feelings for me... I can't score this song anything less than a 10 because I love it. I love the keyboard thing, opening it up. I'm not sure what the instrument was called, but I love the keyboards. 
sound that they've got on the piano at the start. I know Freddie Mercury hated it, but you know, even though Freddie Mercury is a complete legend and I love the guy, but he was completely wrong here. It makes the song. It's so good. It has a great flow throughout the song. Um, Freddie's vocals on it. This is his best vocal performance yet because he was very raw on Death on Two Legs. On the second track, he put kind of a funny old twist on it. Best vocal performance from Freddie yet. This is the Freddie that we know. Um, it's just an amazing song. Absolutely love it. Incredible song. 10 out of 10. Okay, I'm going to have another quick drink because my voice is going. Mm. That's better. We shall continue now. And then we get to the fifth track, which is called 39. Brian May track. And um, yeah, I was... Um, I remember the first time I played this. I'd seen Brian May sing live um, in the early 2000s after Freddie had, of course, moved on. And um, I never thought much of his voice today. So I was thinking the first time I played this, I was like, oh, how's his voice going to hold up on here? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I never thought, I'm, I mean, I can't lie, I'm not the biggest fan of Brian May um, as a musician or a person. I can't lie. I mean, he's good. He's good. But I'm not a big fan. Um, but he, his voice is actually fantastic on this song. It really, the song actually kind of reminds me a bit of um, maybe a Moody Blues type. Fleetwood Mac, late seventies Fleetwood Mac kind of style song, um, and it's it's a very interesting song. He he said in an interview once that he really didn't want to just write another love song. He felt like everyone was doing it, including some members of his band Queen. Um, so he kind of wrote this little story, a little space odyssey type story, where a little team of spacemen go into space on a year long expedition. They come back and it turns out a thousand, a hundred years, sorry, have passed on Earth. And the lyrics are very interesting, and I just love this, because it's a nice acoustic song. I love, you know, these... I see I'm a huge blues fan, as you guys know. I love Eric Clapton, B.B. King, J.J. Cale, um, Robert Johnson, all that kind of stuff. So I love these acoustic-sounding songs. And um, it's very nice to hear that, a song like this on the, this album, because it really is the only acoustic-driven song. There's other songs on here which involve acoustic guitars for a large portion, but they also have other things going on. This song here is the one which really focuses on acoustic, um, you know, backing the song uh, through the rhythm. Um, so it's beautiful. I love this song. It's great. I'm going to give this track a 9 out of 10. I love that track. It is actually incredible. And then we get a track called Sweet Lady, which is a bit more of a heavier track. And I love the guitar riff um, in this one. But, um, and yeah, I mean, it's a very good song. I like this one. It's one of the more very easy tracks I think you know there's a lot going on yes it's a very interesting song however the song doesn't really develop too much and about two thirds of the way through they just kind of jam out and I would have liked to have heard Queen do a nice long jamming session after this I'm sure there's probably outtakes out there somewhere in live performances where they do this but um, I would have liked to hear them just rock out like, and they did rock out but like rock out to a really nice long jam like maybe a couple minutes more very quick jamming session on the end, and it just doesn't really feel like a jamming session because it's too well produced. Um, it's very short. So, yeah, it's not a bad song, Sweet Lady, but it's uh, not not one of my personal favourites. I'm going to give that one a 6 out of 10. And then we get Seaside Rendezvous, which closes Side 1. And Seaside Rendezvous is a piano-based song with pretty much simple lyrics to it, and... It's an innocent song. I like it, but it just doesn't do much for me. It's just kind of pretty easy track to close side one. In fact, I don't really know how to talk about it, to be honest, because there isn't really much to it. Um, I'm going to give that track a 5 out of 10. And then we move on to side two of the record, side two, and we get one of Queen's longest tracks opening it up, which is um, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, song, actually, the opening one, side two. Uh, the, the, the Poets song. Um... It's about a dream which Brian May had just after the album Sheer Heart Attack was released. This one here, where they're all covered in baby oil. Um, <laughs> um, Queen's, it's one of Queen's longest songs. It uh, starts off slow, and I really like this song because it kind of does what I really like long songs to do. It progresses. Again, I'm going to go back to a Steve Winwood album I reviewed. I reviewed Steve Winwood's debut album, and the reason I reviewed that one is to talk about how some long songs generally don't work because they don't go anywhere, like that album. A lot of long songs on there that generally don't go anywhere. Long song here actually goes somewhere. It evolves, it does new things, it changes. Um, it's 
it's a really good build up it has a nice section in it where you just hear freddie's vocals which are incredible while i feel that goes on a little bit too long the vocal section it is incredible to hear his vocal range and it's a great track i'm gonna give that one a seven i really like that then we get love of my life which is a nice slow ballad a much calmer song um just a really beautiful song again it's like not much to say on it there's not much to go with it just freddie's vocals are incredible i love the piano it's a beautiful song eight out of ten there we go get that one done with um <laughs> and then we got a track called good company which is another brian may track the last brian may track on the album of course you can also include um god save the queen as a bit of a brian may track i guess but this is the last proper um brian may song says we as i say i'm yeah, the, the God Save the Queen track on the end. Whether we class it as an actual song or not is another matter. But anyway, um, good company, Brian May. Um, no, this is the only tron so tron This is the only song on the album to actually not feature feature Freddie Mercury, um, which is very strange. Very strange. You know, everyone thinks of Queen. They go, okay, that's Freddie's band, isn't it? Well, that's up for debate. I think it's more Brian May's band. But anyway, um, you know, Freddie Mercury, uh, you know, set out this one out. But um, it's. Yeah, it's an interesting song. It's um, I like the ukulele in it. I'm not sure if it's a ukulele, but it sounds like a ukulele, the mandolin or whatever it was. Um, but anyway, it's a very interesting song. It's not one of my favourites, I can't lie. Uh, but I don't dislike it. I'll, I'll give that one a six. And then, of course, we get to this track, which a few people have heard of. It's probably the most popular one on here. It's called Bohemian Rhapsody. You might have heard of it. Um, <laughs> anyway, I really want to give this song its due, so I'm going to go in with a non, with like a brand new approach to the song, because to be honest, the song gets played on the radio to death, it is winning all these blimmin', um, you know, top 10 songs in the UK lists, and, you know, I'm sorry Queen fans, I but the, the truth is, I think the song has gotten overrated over the years, I think it has generally got played too much, and people have, some people including myself really have got a bit sick of it over the years however however don't kill me yet all right i can see all the thumbs downs on the video coming in right now um <laughs> however i'm gonna look at it from a brand new aspect i've never heard the song before this is my first time listening to it generally this is a brilliant genius masterpiece it really, it, I mean, you can't, it really reminds me in a way of Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. How that song just changes, has a lot going on. This is Queen's Stairway to Heaven. It is just fantastic. The vocal range on it is brilliant. Really no chorus to it. All the sections to it are great. They all slot together well. I love every part of it. This is a 10 out of 10 song. I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. Even though I feel that the public and the radio stations have just played it to death and kind of ruined it. That is not the band's fault. Let's look at it from back in 1975 when it was released. This is an incredible song. It is brilliant. It is an anthem. Um, so yeah, I can't give it anything less than a 10. As much as I would like to, really, because of the public and how we uh, ruined it a bit. The fact is, though, it is still a great song. So I'm going to keep it at a 10. It deserves a 10. It's not the song's fault that it's got played to death. Um, and then we get the track God Save the Queen, which is an instrumental rock version of the British nam National Anthem. And, yeah, you know, I'm going to be a typical Brit here. I actually like our National Anthem. I think it's good. I think we got one of the better National Anthems. Uh, however, Queen's rock version of it, it's pretty much how I feel about it. It's very much, why? This is the point of this? So they could close some concerts in their career? <sighs> Whatever. I'll give that track a 4 out of 10. I don't really care about that one i don't even class it as a proper track really so anyway queen 90 art for let's have a look at the record so here it is love the cover beautiful logo i actually love that album cover back cover pretty simple however if you're like me and a bit stupid at times you can't read all the writing on here so it's a little bit annoying um you get a nice gatefold to it which is nice you get all the lyrics and there's some pictures of the band members down the bottom so yeah Pretty cool. Hold that one up there for you guys. Um, and then you do get a nice little inner sleeve with a picture of the band in concert. And there is the label, which I really like as well. So, yeah. And our album artwork, I'm going to give a 9 to. I really like it. So, anyway, now what I've done is I've added up all of the scores I've given to all of the tracks and now the album artwork. 
and I've divided it by the total number of scores given. And Queen's A Night at the Opera out of 10 for me is going to get a 7.3. So 7.3 for Queen's A Night at the Opera. But of course we're not done there. Now we got now what we got to do is we've got to head over to the album ranking board. Place it on there and see where it ranks compared to other albums. So yes, here we are back over to the album ranking board. And here is my slip for Queen A Night at the Opera with 7.3 there. 7.3. Uh, running out of room actually on here. I should have planned this a bit better. 7.3, uh, yeah, it was squeezed just in there, right in the middle. There we go. Queen and Night the Opera, right there with a 7.3. And it has tied with Eric Clapton's debut album. Um, it has just been beaten out by Peter Gabriel's debut album on a 7.4 and Mud Crutch's 2 on a 7.5. It has managed to just beat out on a 7.2. John Lennon, Yoko Ono's Double Fantasy, Pink Floyd, Animals, and on a 7.1, Lindsay Buckingham's uh, Go Insane. So, not too bad there. So, yes, that is it for this review, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. 7.3 for Queens of Night in the Opera. It's been a fun time in reviewing this album, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, please hit the subscribe button, like the video, and leave a message, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.